Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. We are Guillermo La Torre, Sofia Garcia <coughs> Carretero, and Juan Carlos Gomez Martin. We are going to present today our project, Electrification in Remote Communities, Case Study of Equatorial Guinea. The aim of this project is to identify potential development projects in the Republic of Equatorial Guinea with the, uh, with the use of renewable energy technologies in order to improve the access to electricity in remote communities and in this country. Equatorial Guinea is a country in the west coast of the Gulf of Guinea. It's a, um, a small country, uh, more or less the same area as the autonomous community of Galicia. It uh, has two main regions, the continental region called Rio Muni and the insular region formed by five different islands. The population of the country varies between 700,000 or 1 million 700,000 uh, depending on the source and two thirds of this population live in the continental region while 60% um, of it is do it in rural regions. The biggest cities are Bata in the in the continental region, followed by Malabo, the capital, in Bioko, Bioko Island. It's the, it's the only Spanish uh, colony in sub-Saharan Africa and gained independence in 1968. That year, the country uh, elected democratically his, uh, its first president, but it's, uh, it turned quickly into a dictatorship. And in 1979, it was overthrown by his uh, nephew, Teodoro Via Negema, in this, this guy. And he, he ruled since then in what is considered a, one of the most undemocratic, ethnocentric, and corrupt regime in the world. Um, however, it's one of the fastest growing economies in the last decade in, in Africa. And this is due to the, to the discovery of oil in 1996, which uh, made Equatorial Guinea the third uh, oil exporter in, in sub Saharan Africa. What was a, a traditionally cocoa bean and timber exporter became a, a highly dependent oil economy. And this uh, bring rich, a lot of richness to the country. However, uh, the, um, it, uh, it achieves a $25,700 per capita in ranking the uh, position 58th in the world, far a, a near to countries like Czech Republic or even Italy. However, 70% of the population live with, uh, below $2 per day. So that shows us the, the corruption and the inequality in the regime. Uh, this inequality and also the oil dependence drive the, the country to, to prepare the, the National Economic and Social Development Plan, Horizonte 2020, with aim to reduce poverty and to, to diversify the economy. The first phase of the, of the plan pretended to, uh, is completed already and was focused mainly in the construction of public infrastructure, mainly transport and electricity. And the second phase is aimed to develop the five key sectors of the, of the economy in the country, besides oil. Uh, the National Electrification Program is contained in this plan and it has a 1.7 billion euros investment, uh, mainly used to, to increase the installed capacity of the country. Uh, it quantified the, the install capacity from 2008 to 2011 and it's expected that in 2020 they're going to achieve more than 500 megawatts installed. Uh, however, the, the rate of uh, access to electricity is still 33.7 people lacking access to electricity. Uh, we have analyzed this program and, and uh, find these points as the long-term strategy of the program ensure the energy take independence of the country, interconnection of the national grid, create transnational interconnection, and use clean en en energies. These uh, guidelines have been concretized in different uh, projects, but we found that uh, small islands or remote rural communities were out of the scope of the, of the program, at least until 2020. So we thought that these communities could be a great opportunity to develop a project of ele electrification so we choose Anabon Island, it's a smaller island, 335 kilometers away from the mainland. It has its, its 5,000 uh, inhabitants, like uh, any kind of le electricity and tap water, and they don't have even uh, roads connecting the different segments of the island. So we thought that a successful electrification program on this island could be duplicated in, in different islands of the Gulf of Guinea and also with uh, certain modifications could be replicated too in the rural communities of the mainland. Now my
colleague Guillermo is going to present us the different technologies used for this that could be used for this project. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Uh, here you can see, before starting with the technologies, I would like to remember you the definition of renewable energy technologies that are some technologies that use uh, natural resources without depleting them and um, it are as environmentally benign as possible. Here you can see one that we are going to focus on, uh, a small wind turbine, uh, small hydropower systems and uh, solar PV panels. Well, but why we should focus on renewable energy technologies for this rural development? Well, first of all, because uh, using the renewable energy technologies, uh, we, can pr uh, we can provide the local communities with an opportunity of creating jobs and business, and also to increase the income of, the, of the, these communities. Secondly, uh, renewable energy technologies can help us to reduce uh, diseases that are very common in these areas and to improve the, the health and sanitation condition, <coughs> conditions. Uh, another important thing is education. It's a, a key issue for these development programs. And uh, last but not least, clean energy and affordable energy for everyone. With mm, these issues, we have a 100% natural green energy locally sourced. So here you can see in this chart uh, different renewable energies used in, in some uh, projects that we have researched. Mm, they are uh, distributed by the power, the power output. Um, of course, the, we have in the uh, left side the solar PV panels. Then we, c we are in the small wind turbines and also over there should be uh, uh, the idle power system. Well, this is our overview. That's the image that we want to implement there with a small wind turbines, solar PV panels, mini hydro, some batteries for using the, the technology during the night, and the electrification process is there. Um, first of all, uh, getting deeper in the technologies, uh, for the mini grid, we have selected the stand wall individual system. This is a key issue because it's more or less the structure of the whole system. And we select that because the areas are really isolated and these technologies are very fast to implement, very cheap, and they can be managed by the end users. The standalone system gives, uh, has these different characteristics appropriated in different issues. But for we we, I would like to remark the appropriate for discarded users, fast implementation, management by users, and the energy would be free for these people because they own a producer and they distribute it around their, their area. This is important because in this side of Africa, the people th uh, thought that the energy should be free and provided by the government. <laughs> also, the environmental impacts are really low and the social, the social opportunity to develop local empowerment is, is very high. Well, and this is one of the technologies that we want to implement, solar PV panels. It could be done by each one per house or like a farm formed by two or three to distribute to the whole community. It's the same with a small wind. We can have one per home or three or four forming one farm. The small hydro is a controversial one because it's the most expensive, but also is the one that gives us more energy and during a, a certain time, period of time. Uh, for in order to decrease the, the cost, we would like to uh, use the flows of the river and the gravitation in order to not implement so, so many technolog te technological things that would, would increase the, the price. This is the image that we want to implement there. Uh, don't, don't find so much, please. <laughs> it's a, a just a scheme, but uh, in order to develop in, in so many different regions, the biodigester is also an opportunity, but we, we don't have enough in, uh, information to, in order to implement or not. Uh, because we don't have uh, agriculture or uh, livestock information. Here is a more serious one. You can see the energy sources, a system management and control in the middle, and some batteries in order to have electricity also during the night. Uh, I would like to remember that this is not a profitable project. This is a project for development. So it's has a very fast implementation, is really cheap in order to implement it and has energy uh, and can provide with free energy for the local community with a small uh, social and environmental impacts. But on the other hand, 
it's limited in order to give power and energy and application to this site. So it's a pre-electrification process, it's the first step. Then they should implement more technologies and could be more profitable. But uh, until now, we don't have any kind of profits. But it's an opportunity for local engagement, but also to fill the gap that the government in Nueva Guinea has, has, uh, uh, has created in the electrification strategy. So as I said, the, th the most important threat is the financial problems. We have here a chart that we have researched on some different projects to have an, an idea of the cost. This is the most important cost for the Mavana, that is a small community in the Anamon Island. And of course, the, as I said before, the most Im uh, important cost is the, the small hydrofinance, because it's the one that uh, increased the, this figure. So in order to try to feel or to, to, to get this money, my colleague Sofia is going to explain you some, some different ways to, to get it. So as my colleague Juan Carlos explained before, the background of the Equatorial Guinea, we have a difficult scenario because of the corruption and the lack of information and transparency. And as Guillermo has explained, uh, the different technologies, the different renewables that we can implement in the country, they are not so profitable. But there are some ways to, to find investors to develop the project. Uh, for explaining a little bit the uh, scenario that we have in the financial uh, way, we have some barriers that are the lack of information, the lack of transparency, and the lack of knowledge in, in, in the people that live there. And it, it makes difficult the implementation of the project and the development of the different ways to invest in the project. Uh, this creates a risk a scenario in terms of uh, attract investors because the energy market is not so reliable for them. In terms of the challenges that we found is because they are very high forefront investment so this makes not a, an attractive a field for investors. In the other hand we have a lot of opportunities because it gives an opportunity to the country to develop the, the socioeconomic perspectives but also uh, stop the no stop but reduce the use of fossil fuels and make their the interdependence of the local communities uh, higher, reducing their vulnerability. And the advantages is that the uh, for implement these renewables, we need a framework and some policies to implement there. So it's important to know that we have to work a little bit in the policy of the country to implement this framework. So this is going to be one step forward for the country to move on to move on to move on into a green economy and reach the, the international standards of renewable technologies. Some ways of finance. We we already know that there are a lot of bilateral or multilateral donors, uh, they are private investors, they are a lot of international initiatives, but we have a uh, focus in these ones because they are like more easy. They, they, we, have, we have figured out that these are the most uh, possible way to make the project uh, came up. So at first, we have here the KFW Bank Development, it's a German uh, bank, and they are working in the energy efficiency and the implementation of renewables. They are focusing uh, right now in emerging countries and they are giving the last information that we figure out, they give near $300 billion for, for uh, implement the renewables in, the, in emerging countries. The African Development Bank uh, is working in the implementation of frameworks, of these frameworks also, and the implementation of renewables in, in all around Africa. They are, a, they, are a partner with, they are partnering with the Global Environmental Facility, uh, that is an international mechanism that provides um, finance to, to energy access, energy efficiency, and to reach the technology mix. Um, they have uh, worked before. They have worked before together in Equatorial Guinea. So, as they already know the background, we think that it's a very good opportunity to uh, partner them and invest in the in the project. The Sustainable Energy for All is an international initiative that has that the UN has created. 
Uh, the African Development Bank is uh, committed with this initiative and they are um, implementing also these standards of the access to to make it easier the access to electricity and renewable energies. And at last, and at last, yeah, we have the public-private partnership that we are uh, making like another option for private uh, investors uh, opportunity because they in the developed country they use the framework of this developed country and private investors can go through it uh, contributing to the project and at last as we already know that it's a very it is still very difficult to attract investors we have found the UN the risking instrument that is a public in a framework that the UN has developed with this, they try to reduce the financing cost. They, in the first step, oh, I'm going. in the first step, they uh, evaluate the investment risk. Then they figure out some public instruments to reduce those uh, investment risk. And then they, uh, the output, the outcome that they have is the reduction of the financing cost. So as we can see here, uh, in developed countries. We already know this, the implementation of renewable energies is cheaper than in a developing country, that always the financing cost goes get higher. So with the public de risking instrument that we have over here, this is the situation uh, in the pre in the pre de risking scenario and with the implementation analyzing the risk that we face here, we can develop some mechanism through this framework and uh, we, we could reach this situation uh, facing the, all this risk uh, that we uh, figure out during uh, the whole process of the development of the framework. So this could be the situation and the scenario that we face, that we find in the post the risking situation. So with all this information, we conclude with some outcomes and we, and we uh, establish uh, the, these four ideas were the ones that we came out. So it's the development of a legislative framework to stimulate the renewable energies, both on the supply and the demand side, of course. Integrate programs to uh, develop the renewable energies in the rural areas because it's where the project is focused on. Uh, boost local knowledge for an efficient implementation of, of the renewable energy technologies. And this um, is the, de the, with the development finance institution, uh, we would like to, to boost them to fill the gap more than putting barriers in terms of investment. So, just to finish the project, the presentation, we would like to remind you that uh, it has very difficult to uh, find out the information because of the corruption and uh, we were trying so hard to find out information but they don't have at all. So, we would, maybe we have, we will travel to, a, to Equatorial Guinea to make more um, yeah, more ideas <laughs> of how to develop more precisely this and accurate this project, but this is the more close that we could get. Sophia, you touched on, on this a lot, the, the difficulty because of the, the environment hmm. in Equatorial Guinea. So what I'm interested in is you had a fantastic opportunity to look at, in your choice of Equatorial Guinea, I would have liked to have seen more your criteria for choosing and maybe linking that to the bigger issue of governance. How, and how do we provide um, access to basic services in a country that, as you say, is undemocratic, corrupt? That's, it's very, very challenging. So something around that, and I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts as a group on that challenge. It is a dilemma for many, particularly as, as the market is attractive, for example, to many companies because of the discovery of oil, etc. But there are huge governance issues. It's the elephant in the room. 
and to tinker with the regulatory or policy environment without really tackling the larger issue of, of governance and the political situation is a concern. So your, your thoughts on that would be interesting. Okay. Uh, as we have said before, it's very difficult. The just stops, or you have okay. Uh, it's very difficult to. When I was looking for the ways of investment, it was really really difficult because the scenario was not so attractive for investors. So we were looking more for a way of changing that, not for just attract investors because. We know that we just if, if we just put renewables, okay, where are the investors? They, they are not going to come because it's not reliable. The mark, they are not going to receive a high return rates. So we were studying more like uh, from the perspective of implementing a framework and introduce them in the in the um, in the in the policies that they have. As Juan Carlos has explained before, they have the Horizonte 2020. Uh, legislation and this brings like new sustainable perspectives for the country because they they have they don't they are not a green eco they are not a green economy at all so what we were trying to do is a uh, like enhance the government like maybe pressuring them with some lobby groups or something like that to change a little bit to change a little bit the framework and the policies and move on uh, one step forward uh, from the Horizonte 2020, maybe link, uh, reaching the, uh, looking, seeking the Millennium Goals or international standards or maybe with the, um, the clean development mechanism, maybe they can, burn, they can make some agreement with countries including the policies, some international uh, standards to to go one step forward in the green economy. Is that what you were expecting? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, going to, to what you asked, for example, we found that the IMF and the, and the World Bank didn't work with Equatorial Guinea since the 90s because of the corruption of the country. But we thought that, for example, all the initiatives they have in terms of development always come from a market pressure or, or foreign pressure from other countries. Uh, they take part in the, they try to take part in, the, I think it's the, the initiative for ex a responsible extraction of minerals and, and oil. But they will kick out because they will not complain with the, with the minimums. So we thought that the way to try to implement this is forcing these governance agreements uh, with the trading agreements, basically. From Spain, for example, as what was a former uh, Spain was the, f uh, the biggest uh, commercial partner with Equatorial Guinea since the until the discovery of oil, when the U.S. became the, the biggest partner because of the investment in the in the platforms. So we thought that from Spain, we chose this country because it was a former co Spanish colony, and we thought that from Spain it could be a, gr a good opportunity that linking Delhi is still a, a, a big partner of the country, so linking this with uh, governance forcing them to, to adopt more governance measures in, to implement this, this kind of, of, of projects. So linking this way with the, with the trading, trading agreements of the country. Yeah, just I would like to add that in the strategy that uh, Juan Carlos has explained, they are focused on the, especially on the, uh, how to say, the, not the island, they are forgetting about the island, especially about the rural communities of the island. So the, the, they are planning an electrification process with hydropower in the in, in not in the island side, so they are forgetting about these communities, these communities that we have explained during the presentation. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to know maybe if you mentioned that you, you were one of the officials of this of the country and you were um, receiving yourself or uh, someone from Spain or from an NGO that's going to explain your project. And maybe they should ask, why shouldn't we build a um, cheaper energy plant? Um, maybe should we burn coal or should we maybe burn gas? Uh, what do you think or how would you try to convince them or maybe I don't know, to, to know your idea about, uh, because you said at the beginning that it's not a profitable um, investment, that 
going to take place. I'm not sure about if it's profitable or not. No, I'm, personally, I'm not sure that maybe it could be profitable if they implement a policy that is giving some incentives and then at the same time you have some financing instruments to have lower interest rates, etc. So, I mean, in my opinion, I'm not sure that maybe it would be profitable, but the question is, what would you think about implementing other technologies that could be cheaper than renewables? Uh, well, although the country is, uh, has a huge oil oil component in the economy, they have uh, they are the third producer in the world. They, they lack the capacity of refining this oil, so actually they have to export the oil and build, uh, buy it back, refine. So it's not so re it's not so cheap for the country. The island is 30, 335 kilometers from the from the um, from the mainland, but it's not the from Guinea. It's 30, 335 kilometers from Gabon, so it's even farther to to the country. I think it's it was almost 600 kilometers to to Equatorial Guinea. So we thought that a technology that would be located in the place would be much cheaper in in the long term. Also, there is no, um, there is supposedly um, a connection with the with the mainland, with the country in, in a ship that uh, arrives to the country twice a month. Which I found in the opposition webpage and places like that that is not true. The island, most all the times, uh, American ships arrive to the island like three months, uh, once per three months. So the connection is not well established there, and the idea is that the project is uh, not mm, not for for profit. So in that sense, uh, in we thought that the best solution was a, a, a thing that will uh, stay there and, and will be durable in the long term. So linking the, the, the island to depend on the central government to provide them with fuel, it would not be a, a good idea in the long term from a point of view right now with the situation of the governance in the country. Yeah, also answering your question, I would like to add that um, with these renewable energies that we have uh, presented, we can um, enable the local community empowerment and the use of the knowledge that they have. So this is an, an opportunity for them to have a, a developing program that they could de implement it in another island and also reduce the environmental impact of the places that you can see there. So if you put a plant of coal there, you, you can imagine what would happen in a few years. So this is a clean energy process and also an empowerment the local community. Thank you guys for your presentation. Uh, I'll do a couple of very brief comments um, and a question as well. The first one is based on what Marcus was asking right now. Uh, I think it's a very strong statement to say that this is not a profitable project. It's a development project. It's, uh, this, I think this is a bit misleading, uh, and this is a myth in, in development economics. So I think it's important to recognize that uh, one thing is financial profitability, and another one is economic profitability, and this can be both financial and economic profitable. So I wouldn't see that as a really, really strong statement as you did at the uh, The second comment has to do with the fact that uh, this is clearly a country in which uh, there are energy resources. So it's not a problem of not having primary energy, it's a problem of how that primary energy can be transferred into energy goods. And, and this links back to the, to the comments that even made. I think that more emphasis on governance, more emphasis on institutional setup that will allow these to happen would be, would be welcome. And I've seen, uh, I, I've always perceived that a final project is not the end of nothing, it's just but the beginning of your professional career. So I think that you've got uh, good opportunities to work on the basis of, of this project. My question is when Sophia was nicely presenting all these funding opportunities, and I think you really made a good effort to identify different funding opportunities, you mentioned that one of the alternatives is PPPs. Yeah. Uh, would you see that PPPs are compatible with the rest of the funding sources? And, and in that sense, are not an alternative itself, a drug, rather something which can be compatible with all the sources? Yes, no, I put it there like another option. I put it there like another option, not like an alternative compatible with the other ones, uh, because I think they are like an independent one. 
Maybe, yes. Maybe if they put the public DPPP in Germany and the, and the KFW goes through the framework of the, the, the German governance and working in Equatorial Guinea could work, but I put, it, I put that like it could work in every country, not just in, in Germany or in the bank that I are, that I'm applying for.